they're trained. Um, and this uh, workshop is going to be recorded, but the um, recording will not take place during the question and comment sessions. So um, it's only going to be during the speaker's um, presentation. So if you can uh, accept the recording on your computer, then we can begin. Ready? So um, first I'd like to introduce uh, Madam Yong Zen Yang from the JMPR Secretariat. And she's representing the uh, Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations. Um, I've known uh, Madam Yang for over 15 years, uh, working on various programs to death, uh, together. We conducted some uh, JMPR training uh, several years ago in Africa, Latin America, in Asia. And I've had the honor to uh, work with Madam Yang on many projects. And I can say that um, she's been a real champion for uh, capacity building around the world. Uh, and I, uh, I'm really grateful for um, all of the efforts that she's put forth to, you know, better um, growers um, from, from all the different countries. So she's been just a, a great champion for us. So I'm gonna introduce uh, Yong Zen Yang uh, for uh, some, some uh, opening words. Thank you very much, Jensen. Thank you for your kind of words. So uh, it's my pleasure to work in together with all of you, especially we had a very pleasant and fruitful collaboration with USDA and also the other uh, partners in the Latin America region. Uh, so uh, good morning again, everyone. First of all, on behalf of FEO, I'd like to welcome all of you to this uh, workshop on advanced concepts of the FEO manual on pesticide residue evaluation and the MRL setting. And uh, as uh, Jensen mentioned that this workshop is a special and is holding virtually via video conference and uh, the current special circumstance of the COVID-19. In this regard, I wish to um, express my uh, sincere appreciation to Dr. Dark and Drust and his team of the Minor Youth Foundation for their effective work, excellent work in preparation and the organization of this workshop. Thank you very much. So the FU and WHO joint meeting on pesticide residue, we call GMPR, plays a key role in the establishment of uh, international standard for pesticide residues. The GMPR principle and the pre pr uh, procedures have been accepted in worldwide. Member countries really wish to participate in standard setting process and also have opportunity to do so. However, and the developing countries sometimes facing uh, difficulties in coping with this commitment because their lack of expertise and the resources. To meet this request, FEO has conducted a series of training workshop in collaboration with like USDA and with other member governments and also country and to strengthen their capacity of the scientists from developing countries in pesticide residue evaluation and the MRL setting. Also to update their knowledge of the assessment of the risk associated with the dietary intake of the pesticide residue. In this, this is the second workshop as uh, uh, Jensen mentioned. This is actually the second workshop in this region. And the, we, have the, we had the previous workshop held in collaboration with Edward and the Chile government and in February, 2020 in San Diego. That was a very successful workshop as well. So I'm very pleased to say today, we have so many 60 or now it's 70, more than 70 participants and join this current workshop. It's confirmed that the importance of the pesticide residue standard in this region, and also the continued interest of the countries in the scientific assessment for setting codex MRL. The region of Latin America and the Caribbean covers main agriculture production and the trade countries. 
food safety standard is an increasing important issue in this region for safeguarding the domestic consumers and for facilitating the international trade. We are pleased to notice that in recent years, the Latin American countries have proactively participated in the CCPR and the codex activities and play an important role in the establishment and the implementation of the codex MRLs. In the meanwhile, we also noted that the capacity in data submission for setting codex MRLs and in expertise for GMPR evaluation need to be enhanced. The main objective of this workshop, as Jensen already mentioned, are to give a better understanding of the FAO manual on risk assessment, request for residue trials, and the estimation of MRLs, to building the knowledge of the national experts in the region to join the GMPR evaluation as a panel member of the GMPR. Hence, to assist the countries in deeper in involvement of the country of the region in the process of the Codex MRL. So uh, actually the agenda of this workshop is quite uh, intensive, especially the workshop is conducted virtually. So uh, today is our honor for having Professor Eloisa Cardos to facilitate this workshop. She is very knowledgeable and experienced in GMPR evaluation and the MRL uh, estimation since she has been working with GMPR as an FEO panel member for 24 years. She's really very, very experienced. Therefore, this is a very good opportunity for us to learn more from Professor Carders about the risk assessment and the MRL setting. I believe what you learn from this workshop will benefit you, not only your institute, but also your country and in improvement of food safety and in setting of the MRLs. With this, Jensen, I would like to close my welcome remarks and wish all of you a very successful workshop. Thank you very much. Thank you again, and uh, I'm really looking forward to working with you again, Matt Payne, on this one. Thank you. Uh, next, I would like to introduce uh, Dirk Drost, who's retired from Syngenta in 2019 after 37 years working in the crop protection industry. Um, Dirk at that time represented Syngenta as a liaison to the IR4 project, which many of you may know the IR4 project. And he collaborated on many research projects uh, with them resulting in new uses for specialty crops and minor uses. Um, Dirk, he still remains active in the uh, specialty crop and minor use area as a board member for the Council uh, for Agriculture in Science and Technology, but also as a board chairman for the Minor Use Foundation. So with that, I would like to introduce uh, another real champion for farmers around the world, um, Dirk Drost. Dirk, uh, I think, are you there? You might be on mute. He was here. <laughs> we'll give him a second to try to find him. Eh, eh, Dirk dice que perdió un momento la conexión. No sé si podemos pasar con, con la siguiente primero para que él pueda volver a conectarse. Yes. Ya se conectó. Ok. Ok, ya tenemos de vuelta a Dirk. Okay. Oh, he's back. Ok.
So we'll give Dirk a moment then to uh, join in. Otherwise, we'll move to the next one. But I'll give Dirk another I'm, minute. There I'm, we go. I'm good back. job. Okay. I'm back. Good. I lost my connection. Um, hello, everyone. Dirk Drost here. Welcome to this workshop. I'm I'm great grateful that all of you have taken your time to participate. And I also am very grateful for the for the kind comments uh, from Madam Yang about the organization of the workshop. I give credit to Veronica and, and Adriana who've organized the conference and done such a wonderful job in um, bringing us all together uh, today. So welcome. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Adriana, can you advance the slide, please? If not, I'll just uh, go ad lib. Recording in progress. Maybe you can share your presentation. Adriana is sharing the presentation and advancing the slides for me. I did not, uh, I gave it over to them. I'm very good. Uh, thank you. I just heard. Uh, Podrían poner la pantalla completa, por favor. No, es que no me está dando, por eso quedó. Disculpe. En la base está el de pantalla completa. Es que estaba intentando y ahí cuando se queda bloqueada, pero intentaré de nuevo. Ahí está. Ahí está. Muchas gracias. Okay, again, welcome everyone and thank you. Um, the Minor Youth Foundation is governed by a board of directors and uh, you see the board of directors there. Uh, Jason is a member, Michael, Alan Norton, Dan Kunkel and Jerry Barron. Some of these people uh, may be familiar to you. Um, we will distribute this slide deck and make it available to participants in the workshop today. So, and I will, I will move along uh, speedily in order to um, allow most of the time to be spent on workshop related topics. Next slide. I'm, I'm just going to um, thank you uh, for participating today. Um, the Minor Use Foundation is, is uh, pleased to be a partner with the um, uh, JMPR Secretariat with the United States Department of Agriculture and the Foreign Ag Service and other stakeholders to be able to um, sponsor this workshop today. So we're grateful for the, the, your participation. Our foundation is relatively new. We've started it about two and a half years ago um, in order to extend, um, extend and organize the benefits that all of us can obtain from having Codex MRLs and participating in, in capacity building as well as training sessions like this. Working together, we'll be able to advance the needs for our growers and grower groups and also have a modern, safe, um, scientifically based regulatory uh, frameworks which support um, all of our good work. So with that and, um, and my introduction, I thank you very much for being here today, for participating in our workshop. Um, the slide deck will be presented and shared with you after the workshop today. Um, and I, I'd be um, honored to take any questions that you might have in the chat or offline. Um, about the slide deck once you get to review it. So once again, on behalf of the foundation and our partners, um, we welcome you to the conference and we wish you a wonderful conference. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dirk. Thank you. Um, from here, we're gonna, um, I'm gonna introduce uh, Anna Marisa Cordero, who is the coordinator of the Agricultural Health, Food Safety and Quality Program at IECA. Uh, Anna Marisa has been providing support and collaboration uh, for the pesticide residue trials that are carried out throughout Latin America, so you may know her from that. Um, she also is providing a lot of effort uh, for these capacity building workshops and other programs um, uh, throughout uh, Latin America as well. So uh, I'm going to introduce Anna Marisa, who will provide some opening remarks for uh, AICA.
Hola, hola a todos y todas. Espero que se encuentren súper bien. Muchas gracias, Jason, por eh, la presentación y a los organizadores por la eh, invitación al ICA a participar en, este, en esta iniciativa del día de hoy. Eh, yo, pues, eh, tal vez eh, iniciar eh, nada más eh, mencionando que esta... Esta actividad del día de hoy es una muestra de eh, la articulación que eh, las diferentes organizaciones debemos tener para tratar de optimizar nuestros esfuerzos, nuestros recursos eh, y buscar complementariedades. Creo que eh, todos venimos trabajando en la realización de esfuerzos de cooperación técnica importantes y en esa línea eh, lo que estamos haciendo hoy es una muestra más del compromiso que todos tenemos para eh, unificar esfuerzos, buscar complementariedades y tratar de brindar una cooperación técnica eh, de, ex de excelencia. Eh, otro tema que consideramos importante es que eh, estamos haciendo también un esfuerzo importante trabajando con eh, nuestros socios presentes el día de hoy para eh, generar y fortalecer capacidades en los países sobre los temas de usos menores, con el fin de que estos cuenten con herramientas e instrumentos que puedan generar la información necesaria para la generación de LMRs en el ámbito eh, multilateral. Y eh, esto está estrechamente ligado con eh, la importancia de trabajar para hacer estas iniciativas eh, sostenibles eh, y continuas a nivel de los países, a nivel de las regiones y la única forma de lograr esto es trabajar en el fortalecimiento de las estructuras institucionales buscando la implementación de marcos jurídicos eh, eh, fuertes, sólidos, eh, basados en ciencia y eh, promover la participación activa en los foros internacionales donde se genera la, la normativa eh, internacional. Eh, de una u otra forma también mencionar y fel felicitar a los organizadores de este evento porque eh, esa sostenibilidad a la que hacía mención anteriormente eh, está reflejada en este, en este evento que se organiza el día de hoy porque eh, mucho se centra en que los países generen proyectos dirigidos a fortalecer la normativa sanitaria y fitosanitaria y este evento de una u otra forma, esta actividad de una u otra forma representa eh, un seguimiento a eh, actividades que se ejecutaron hace unos años y la idea es eh, conocer eh, avances tratar de compartir eh, experiencias y a partir de esa, de esa forma buscar realmente esa eh, continuidad y esa sostenibilidad que es tan importante para el fortalecimiento de las estructuras institucionales en los países. Así que pues con esto nuevamente darles las gracias, desearles mucho éxito en el evento del día de hoy y eh, pues seguimos en comunicación. Muchas gracias Jason. Thank you, Anna. Um, before I hand it over to Eloisa, I just want to uh, thank a couple other key partners. Um, we have uh, the Standard and Trade Development Facility, which some of you may know about, but the STDF um, is a, has been a great partner uh, in these efforts over the last uh, many years with us. Uh, they've helped us um, put together uh, very big uh, successful projects uh, on conducting the residue field trials. And we submitted that data to the JNPR to establish new codex MRLs from several countries around the world. And these workshops and even the Minor Use Foundation uh, is really the result of these very successful projects that were carried over the course of uh, several years with many of the countries um, that, that are on the call here today. So I do want to thank the STDF for um, really helping to kick this whole uh, program off uh, many years ago and has been a great partner. The other one is just quickly is the US Department of Agriculture's Foreign Agricultural Service who have provided uh, resources and time 
um, uh, for the residue projects and um, also for these capacity building efforts. And then lastly, the IR4 project. Um, the IR4 project is really the glue that's been holding all of these different projects together by providing really the technical expertise and the guidance um, to, to make it all happen. Okay, so thank you to those key partners. Um, next, we're gonna have uh, the star of our program. Uh, I think most of you might know her, uh, and if you don't, you you really should. She's been a, also a really great friend uh, to minor use uh, projects around the world. Uh, and this is Eloisa Dutra uh, Cald Caldas uh, from Brazil. And um, Eloisa Dutra has a BS uh, in chemistry and a master's in analytical chemistry from the University of Brasilia. Um, and has a PhD in agricultural chemistry from the University of California in the United States. She's currently a full professor at the Department of Pharmacy and responsible for the Laboratory of Toxicology and where she coordinates projects on method development and analysis of pesticide residues and contaminants in foods and dietary exposure assessment among many other things. Uh, professor Caldas has been a member of the JMPR as Ban Myang uh, mentioned since uh, 1997 and she's published over 70 scientific papers and presented numerous lectures at international meetings. And so we're very honored to have such a highly respected and highly regarded uh, presenter with us for the week. Um, we are very lucky. And with that said, I would like to hand it over to um, Eloisa. Maybe she can just say a few words about herself and about the project or about the program um, and we can get underway. We are gonna to try to take a break after about an hour and I'll prompt Eloisa at that time when we'll have our break. But um, I'm gonna pass it over to Eloisa. So thank you. Um, thank you, good morning to all and thank you for the invitation to perceive, uh, to give this workshop. Uh, thank you, Jason, for your kind words. And um, so I, I may say that um, as an analytical chemist, I found myself as an analytical chemical uh, chemist uh, at GMPR because it was there that I understood the concept of um, dietary risk assessment. So uh, my background as an analytical chemist and as a professor of basic toxicology kind of make, make sense of everything. That's why um, I love the subject of dietary risk assessment. Uh, I'm going to share myself the presentation uh, with you today. And um, we gave uh, here in Latin America this training during um, the whole week. So four hours training for a smaller group. Uh, and the good thing about the, the remote workshop is that many other people may, uh, many of other people have access to that, which is, which is very good. Although we lose the contact, the personal contact. So this is uh, a larger audience has access to that. Uh, so I'm gonna try here in 15 hours only uh, to kind of summarize, because I see that uh, uh, during the workshop in Santiago last year, I think we were about 30. Uh, there were about 30 people attending, and now we have over 70. So it's probably for many of you who are attending this uh, workshop, uh, they will, uh, you will hear the points that I'm going to bring here for the first time. For the others, it will going to be um, a revision of what we have seen in Santiago. So uh, it's very difficult to, to use the word advanced here because actually for many of you, uh, it's the first time you hear some of the, the issues that we're going to discuss um, this week. So I'll try to do my best in kind of summarizing a 40, hours um, workshop training in 15 hours or, or less than that. So we'll, we'll see how, how it's going. So uh, Zen already, um, I call her Zen, sorry. She's 
my colleague and my friends. Uh, oh, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> uh, she mentioned already the main objectives of this workshop. I have them uh, in more details here. So it's really to in introduce the topics with the spe specific examples to provide sufficient background to understand the GMPR manual and the GMPR procedure. Uh, show the logic and the critical um, aspects of the evaluation process because uh, the evaluation process at GMPR goes far beyond the manual. Uh, the manual it's a written uh, book, but actually uh, <laughs> many things are not straightforward uh, as it's written in the manual. In the manual, a lot of discussion goes on for sometimes seems to be very simple, um, issues. Uh, but the main point is that uh, the importance of applying science and um, also past experience in correctly interpreting data in reaching valid conclusion. This is very key. Of, of course, during a short uh, training like this one, it's very hard to see only if you really participate it, at GMPR. But it's it's really science and uh, experience. So that's why it's very important to have uh, always new people to bring new ideas and new inform scientific information, but also uh, in conjunction with people who has been doing that for many years, uh, bringing the past experience. So, um, so we, we'll see how you're gonna catch these points during this workshop. And also, as uh, Ben mentioned, to improve the participation of member states, oh, there is a mistake there, um, at CCPR, because many people really uh, don't understand what's happened uh, when they go to CCPR, they see all those numbers coming uh, and they have to accept or approve it at, at the final uh, CCPR meeting the final uh, day of the CCR meeting. So it's very important if you understand how those numbers were generated, it will facilitate for you to really have a critical view of the number and accept it or not, of course, because uh, what we do at GMPR, we make recommendations to CCPR. Uh, it, it's up to CCPR as uh, risk manager to accept or not. So we do our job as a uh, risk assessors uh, and CCPR do its job as a risk manager. Sometimes these two roles are kind of mixed. So it's very important for you to see uh, they are, uh, we work together with CCPR, but each um, body has its um, specific objectives and uh, role in the whole process. And also we hope actually uh, that some information that we're going to give you, the GMPR procedure, can help uh, with the national um, evaluation of uh, pesticide residue data. Because actually at GMPR, as we have members from many uh, bodies and countries, after all, it's kind of a blend of what's happening worldwide. And that can help um, national government and national experts in their own evaluation. Uh, just a summary of the whole system of the CCPR, GMPR system. So you see here, uh, the GMPR has two bodies, the FAO panel, uh, two panels actually, the FAO panel who is responsible for the residue evaluation and the WHO panel, uh, which is responsible for the toxicological evaluation. We work during the meeting, which happened with the exception of last year and this year, either in Rome or in, in Geneva, although we had some meetings in other cities as well, uh, two exceptions only. Uh, so we work separate in separate um, rooms, but we always talk and we always meet uh, to reach consensus on some issues that is linked to both activities. 
Uh, I'm part, I have been parting, I was part in the FAO panel uh, and uh, normally here in the FAO panel, you see more agronomists, chemists, um, and here in the WHO panel, more toxicologists. So it's really uh, different uh, people with different backgrounds who goes to uh, who participate in those panels. Uh, the main objective of the FAO panel is to estimate the uh, maximum residue levels, uh, the STMR and the HR, um, and to conduct the dietary risk assessment. And the WHO panel, the final goal is to establish ABI and reference uh, dose, but of course, uh, also doing the dietary risk assessment, which uses uh, STMR, HR, ADI, uh, and acute reference dose numbers. Uh, so this will be the topic of Thursday or Friday. So uh, for those of you who are not very familiar with the dietary risk assessment process, this we make will be more clear at the end of the week. So we make our recommendations to CCPR uh, and CCPR uh, in most cases uh, it does uh, turn our recommendation or MIL because we estimate MIL and then we recommend MIL to CCPR and then CCPR consider those MILs, MILs uh, and transform them in the codex um, MRLs, which is what actually, that's the final outcome of the whole process. Uh, it's very important uh, to remember that uh, contrary to the CCPR, people who attend the CCPR, at GMPR, we are, we are not there. I'm not there as Brazil, I'm there as Eloisa. So uh, the experts are independent. They are selected or invade, invited based on their personal capacity. And we don't represent a, uh, our government. So, and sometimes um, you see uh, people from US, from UK or from China, from Japan uh, are green on some, and this goes to both FAO panel and WHO panel. Uh, so we agree, we reach an agreement in the group uh, that may be contrary to the agreement that a person have, has reached or a group of people have reached at their country. So it's very important to see that, um, although of course uh, the experience that each person brings from one country help uh, the group uh, to reach a final conclusion, but it will never be a final conclusion of one country. It's a final conclusion of final agreement among the uh, independent experts. This is very important. So that's why I say that I feel very comfortable uh, as a risk assessor, because really uh, I'm more a person link it to the science because I am at the university. So science research, it's my focus. Uh, then, um, yes, being in the Codex Alimentary uh, at the CCPR meeting, although I have, uh, I had participated in some CCPR meeting where it's very difficult to have scientific discussion. But at GMPR, that's all we have. We have scientific discussion all the time. And that's why I always say that I've learned everything I know about pesticides, actually I learned at GMPR. And that kind of guide me uh, many of my research projects at, uh, at the university. The products of uh, our work are two main documents, the evaluation, uh, which contains the raw data, which was provided by the companies and also by national governments who uh, provide data to GMPR. And then we, the experts, evaluate the data, either residue data or toxicological data. So the evaluation is um, two parts, the residue part, that's what I'm showing here, and uh, the uh, toxicolo uh, toxicological parts. So there are two documents, two evaluations that 
are the products of each meeting every year. And it's important to understand that uh, at the final day of the meeting, which lasts uh, almost three weeks, we have this document basically ready. So there is some final revisions afterward, but everything is done during the meeting. And of course, we have to go to the meeting with all the documents prepared to be um, discussed during the three weeks, two, three weeks of the meeting. Uh, and in uh, the last evaluation published was from 2019, because in 2020, uh, there was no uh, meeting. And this year we had a remote meeting but the evaluation um, has not been released yet. So, uh, and you can have access to all the documents, evaluation and report at the FAO website. Uh, and the conclusions and our recommendations to CCPR are in the report. And here you have both residues and the toxicology. So, uh, so those are the documents that we produce in addition to the evaluation of the toxicological part. Uh, for the FAO part, which is the focus of this workshop, the evaluation contains, uh, it's normally big, big documents. Each evaluation uh, book may be for the residue part, 500 page, 600 page. Uh, and we have all the detail, of what was provided uh, by the company. Either if there is a evaluation, uh, re-evaluation, uh, evaluation, short evaluation so, uh, only for additional crops. So it's much smaller, but here, if you have a new compound to be evaluated, or you, if you have a periodic review of a note compound, so you should have a complete evaluation with all the information that is essential to do a complete evaluation of, of the compound. So we have identity of the compound, metabolism in environmental fate, plant, um, animal, uh, residue analysis, analytical methods, uh, use pattern, the big table of use pattern, which are uh, the gap information, how the data, the big tables uh, with the residues data, fate of residues in storage and processing. We're gonna be talking uh, over these issues and residues in animal commodities, which are derived uh, different than we derive from plant commodities. Uh, so, uh, and here in the evaluation, you have all the raw data provided by the companies or sometimes by national governments in the appraisal, which is in the report. And then you have a summary of the information that was given and you have the interpretation of the data, our interpretation of the data. Uh, and also what is important is that in the report that you find the residue definition, which is a key issue uh, in the GMPR and national uh, evaluations of pesticides. And then we, in the report, we spell out the selected uh, residues from the supervised uh, trials and summarize the other, the other issues and also uh, the summary of the director risk assessment. And then a table of recommendation. So, uh, and that's the table of recommendation that goes to CCPR for a uh, decision if our recommendation are accepted and are turned into uh, CXL. Uh, so going into the section one of the program, I had to change a little bit the section one because it was mentioned only environmental fate, but we cannot talk about um, uh, GMPR work without talking also about metabolism in plants and in animals. Uh, so I include this here. I try not to be too extensive on this issue. Uh, and here I mentioned where you can find this information in the FAO manual in chapter three, yes, 3.31, two, three, and four. 
Uh, normally, uh, in the FAO manual and in our work as well, we start with uh, metabolism in plants and animals, and then we go to environmental fit. But here, I kind of will follow uh, the, the program. So we're going to talk about environmental fate, and then uh, we will include it, uh, metabolism in uh, plants and animals. How do you, how to use? So in addition to the requirement, how can we use this data uh, to make, how this data are used in the benefit of understanding the residue data uh, and make our recommendations. Uh, and at the end, we want to give some examples. Uh, so first, uh, the requirements for environmental fate. Uh, and I'd like Jason to tell me, because I cannot see the watch here, uh, just one or two minutes before the break, just to let me know, because sometimes uh, we lose control of the time here. Please, okay, okay. So uh, here are some requirements are the requirements for environmental fate studies. This table is a summary of the table that is in the manual. Uh, so I removed some data where some uh, studies there were no, 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 no in our lines. Uh, so here only the studies that are required at some point. And these, these um, studies are relevant um, to the potential of uptake of residues by food and feed crops. After all, these studies are relevant, as I mentioned before, to, uh, to determine or to um, uh, make the decision of what is what are the residues residues expected in food and in feed crops. So you have physical and chemical properties. Uh, this is this uh, physical and chemical properties. Normally they are <clears throat> actually uh, including the first part of the evaluation uh, and they are conducting technical material. For example, studies on hydrolysis, water hydrolysis, photolysis, and there are a lot of chemical uh, properties, um, uh, solubility, uh, there are a lot of uh, chemical properties. Sometimes if you don't have uh, hydrolysis and photolysis data in the identity part of the, of the evaluation, then you should include them here. But normally we do have those data in the, in the information about the technical material at the beginning of the evaluation. And then we start to see all the information and uh, the requirement will depend on how the compound is applied. So is the compound applied as a foliar application? Is the compound applied to the soil? Uh, special case for root, tube and bulb because, and then how they studies um, the, uh, so uh, because of the close contact of these crops with the soil, if the compound is applied as a seed dressing, if it is a herbicide also, because normally you apply the herbicide around, in most cases, uh, around the plant itself. So with the close, um, so close contact with the soil. And a uh, special case is patty ice where uh, the rice is grown in the water. So you want to see that uh, it's really a special case. So uh, in some cases, uh, it's yes, you need that study. No other alternative. Sometimes you know you don't need that study. Although these are the requirements of GMPR. Although many companies, they do, uh, provide more studies that are required. Sometimes, uh, so we do receive some studies that comes as an additional. This table is really what's really requir required. Without it, really the compound, the evaluation of the, uh, the, the compound is compromised. Uh, 
So you have, yes, for example, aerobic degradation soil. Of course, if the application is foliar, you don't need it. And you don't need also for peria or rice, but in other, and, uh, every other type of application, you do need it. Soil photolysis. Uh, he, sometimes you need it, although, um, no, sorry. <laughs> Soil photolysy, you also need uh, for those applications except foliar and peri eyes. Uh, plant surface photolysis, it depends. Sometimes you have that information during the plant metabolism study, and there is no need for a special uh, study in this topic of environmental fate. So uh, maybe conditional because you may have that information later one in the, uh, or earlier one because it's reversed uh, the order here uh, for, for foliar application and also for uh, root tub tubers and bulb crops. Uh, for uh, peria, uh, rice, sometimes you do need that information. Although you, again, you may have that information in the plant metabolism study. Uh, photolysis uh, in water, of course, uh, only for paddy, paddy rice. Uh, and uh, that you may have that information again for rice, but it's a very useful information when the application of the pesticide is to the water surface. Rotational crop. Uh, of you need that information, confined rotation crop where the study is conducted with label, pesticides, cyprotein pesticides. We'll talk about this later. Uh, but of course, it's not required when no crop ro uh, rotation are expected. For, for example, permanent crops, orchards, apple, pears. Uh, of course, they are not re required in that um, if the pesticide is only registered for ocean. But in most cases, you have the pesticide uh, uh, registered in many crops uh, in addition to, wash, to oceans. That's why rotation crops, refined rotation crops, uh, you find it in most of the, um, uh, of the evaluations. And of course, for paddy rice, you don't need that. Field rotation uh, crops, uh, it depends. Field ro rotation crop and field dissipation, it depends uh, on the results of the confined rotation crop study. Uh, in many cases, so the company, they just uh, provide that the data. And we just use that, um, report that in the evaluation and summarize it in the report. It's always um, additional information that it's uh, useful. Uh, biodegradation in water, of course, you only need for, uh, for paddy rice, uh, mainly if uh, the, the Sorry, because I have this here that I, that is in the bottom of my slide, so I don't need it. I don't read it, what is written there. But it's really, uh, even for paddy rice, um, it's really conditional only when the pesticide is added to the water itself. So the, those are the requirements. Uh, again, the company, in most cases, uh, they provide more than that. And in some cases, they do not provide what is required, we, which can really uh, prevent us to go forward in the evaluation. So I mentioned uh, the confined study, the environmental, uh, uh, the rotational crop confined studies, and also in the meta plant metabolism, in animal metabolism, uh, they need to be conducted using C14 label compounds um, because you need really, uh, because uh, when you have label compounds, you have detectors uh, that are, uh, you can detect very, very low amount of the label compounds with radioactive detectors, detectors. So it's essential really to follow uh, the environmental fate in the metabolism 
pathway with label compounds. And um, the companies, most companies, of course, they know exactly what you do. So they synthesize those compounds uh, with uh, the position of the label uh, correctly uh, put in the correct place so we can uh, see how the metabolites and degradates. Actually, I use meta the word metabolite for plant and animal and degradates in soil and water. But you can, uh, some people use the word metabolite for uh, soil and water. Metabolites, normally you have, uh, uh, the metabolism is catalyzed by enzyme, but sometimes you have some bacterial actually who degradates the, the compound in the soil. Uh, here, an example. Fenvarylate, uh, you have fenvarylate here where the label was put in this position. Let me use the, yes. When the label is put in this position here. So what means that you only gonna catch the, the, the breakdown, the compounds resulted from the degradation or the metabolism in plant or in soil uh, that have this part of the molecule, uh, the molecule which is labeled because the detector only uh, can detect what is what uh, is labeled with C14, carbon C14. Uh, so for example, here you have the metabolism, the breakdown of the mo molecule. Uh, so, and then you can, you want to see this part of the molecule, those metabolites you can see in this experiment, but you don't see anything from this side of the molecule. But then most in this case, so the company conducted study with the label in this position and also on different studies, uh, different study with the label in this position. And then uh, you can see these, the metabolites or degradation products uh, that contain this, the right part of the molecule. So uh, the position of the, of the label of the C14 must be very clear in the evaluation in the study. Uh, the, co the company cannot just say label uh, compound. It has really to identify where the label was. Uh, and that's this case uh, where we show. So when the label is in this position, we see the left side of the molecule, the degradants or the metabolites, which contain the left side of the molecule. And <clears throat> when it's labeled at the right, at this position, we see the other side of the molecule. As I said, when you have a big molecule like that, which will be fragmented uh, uh, in two, uh, we may say here, we normally have two different studies. Uh, and uh, what we have later is the complementary information taken from each study. But there are some studies, some, in some case, for example, protoconazole, which is a triazole, uh, where you have um, in the same molecule, uh, the, the compounds uh, label in the phenyl ring here, and which is very common because this part of the molecule it's uh, normally a uh, degradation product or an, a metabolite of uh, triazoles. In this case, you have a compound that is labeled in both positions. Um, another uh, example is chrysoxine metal. In this case, you have label in three different positions. And this other compound, you also have a, a molecule which was labeled in these two positions. Uh, so just some example, and this is key information. And the companies normally, they know exactly what to use. They know exactly what to synthesize. But again, you cannot derive the correct information if the label is not in the correct place. So uh, what do we need? And this, uh, just to, to say that these comments about labeling uh, goes for environmental faith and metabolism studies uh, as well. But going back specifically to, envir uh, to environmental faith studies, uh, which kind of information I get from environmental faith studies? 
Uh, first of all, what is the nature, which compound is formed, and what is the magnitude of the residues in soil? So the nature is a qualitative and the magnitude of residues uh, is quantitative. So is this degradate, degradate in the soil represent how much of the total radioactive residues? Uh, so this is a key information, not uh, only the nature of the degradate, but also how much it represents. Is there a major degradate compound that should be considered? Um, will the residues persist uh, for a long time? And uh, for example, I may find this, this substance in the next for rotational crops, uh, crops that are rotated. For example, I may plant one crop harvest and plant another crop. We're gonna talk more about the rotational studies. And we plant one crop, uh, we, uh, for example, that is applied to the soil and then we harvest that crop and then we plate, we plant in the top of that soil which was treated before a different crop. So will uh, these um, residues persist in the soil that can be uptaken? uptaken by rotational crop or even by an ocean, for example, a herbicide. So I applied to the soil of that ocean, ocean will that um, pesticide be uptaken by the tree of that ocean? So we need uh, that kind of information. Uh, are there unique metabolites that I can only find in the soil or in the water? uh that for example i don't find in the crop itself when i apply for example as a foliar application uh so so are there unique metabolites which are only formed in the soil or in the water so this is an important information because if that metabolite is major i should consider it uh, and it, i should look for it in the plant um, and in some case, I may consider that in the residue definition. Uh, is the compound susceptible to photolysis? So is the compound is degraded uh, by the sunlight, for example? Uh, and uh, finally, uh, so again, this is linked to the previous uh, bullets. So are those information important as well to interpret metabolism in residue studies, in, in uh, metabolism in plants and in, mainly in plants? Uh, for example, if a, a compound is formed in the soil, is taken up by the, the plant or transferred to the, temp, to the plant in rotational crop, so maybe that unique uh, degradation product from in the produced in the soil may be metabolized in the in the plants. So we have to be able to know where that metabolite came from, not from the pesticide itself, which was applied to the plant, but from the soil as a product of the degradation in the soil. So uh, those are some of the information that uh, I essential. Again, at, after all, what you want to have, it's a clear uh, uh, information about which residues I'm going to find in the crops, in the plants. So here I'm going to give you uh, one example for studies where uh, the metabolism, uh, the environmental fate was very key. Uh, for example, boscalite. Boscalid was first evaluated by the GMPR in 2006. I remember very much uh, of that Boscalid because it's always a good example of how a compound can persist in the soil and can be taken up in rotational crop. So at that time in 2006, we could not go, uh, go forward. No, actually, I, I, I may, uh, I may, go back to my, it was first submitted to before 2006, I think 2003 or four. But then it was clear that the compound was persisted in the soil. And, uh, but there were no rotational crops studies. 
So we could not go forward in that evaluation. And we made clear why the evaluation of the Bosca lead was not preceded. We couldn't do anything. So what we did at that time, as normally we do, we dropped the compound yeah, in the middle of uh, when it was clear that we did not have enough information to proceed with the evaluation. Um, the evaluation stopped there. And uh, it was clear for the company that they need to conduct uh, rotational crop studies. So they did that because they knew that if they did not do that, nothing will go forward in the system and provide that study in 2006. And then uh, the compound was, was evaluated in 2006, 2008 and 2009 GMPR. So those studies showed uh, that Boscalid is very persistent in the soil. Just stay there. You can see the molecule here. Although there are many points uh, of degradation here, uh, it just stayed there. It didn't go away for a long time. Uh, the half-life could be over one year. There was a specific study where the half-life was over 700 days. So over two years. So it's a very persistent compound in the soil. And uh, field uh, dissipation studies show that it just doesn't move. Uh, it's important to mention before I go forward with the environmental issue is that um, our objective for the environmental study is really the residues in plant. Uh, do not confuse with some studies that will have an impact in the environmental and in other species living in the environmental, in the environment. Uh, so just to make clear that uh, here we are not concerned on other species uh, in addition to human species. So my, our objective here is really what people um, are eating uh, the plants uh, that people or animals, uh, farm animals are eating. So here it shows in the field dissipation study that the boscali did not move. And this is also important issue for environmental issues uh, because it does not move. So maybe it does not reach deep water reservoirs. So just an additional information that is relevant to, to environmental issues. Um, so it just went to the soil, did not degradate very well at all, and just stayed there in the top 10, most of it, in the top 10 centimeters layer for months, for months, just stayed there. And the most important thing is what is taken up extensively by crops grow in treated areas. Uh, so following repeated application of the compounds at gap rates, the residues uh, in the soil vary approximately in the range of 0.5 to 2 milligrams per kilogram. This is a lot. So we do have to consider the residues that is taken up, is stayed in the soil and may be taken up for the succeeding crops and be part of the residues of the succeeding crops. Um, so just this graphic here just shows that, for example, uh, in the evaluation of 2006, there are different graphs, the graphs showing the same thing. Uh, here it's uh, a study where Boscalid showed the DT50, DT which is the half-life in soil of one year. You see that at, when the compound was applied at different rates to the soil per year, 1.2 kilogram per hectare per year, 1.9 in 4.5. In our cases, so it's independent, the rate is independent and the, the, the half-life is independent of the rate that is applied to the soil. So you can see it increase uh, for some times and just stay there, stay there. This is um, succeeding application, yeah? So one year application, the next year it was applied again, applied again, and here over 20 years. 
So we just stay there, but it reached a plateau after about five, six, seven years. Just stay there, just stay there. So we just, we really have to take it into a point. Very few compounds that I've seen uh, behave so strongly, uh, uh, stick to the soil so strongly as boscalid. So boscalid is just the, uh, the, the example to show that. So what was the conclusion in 2009 GPR? So when we recommend residues in plant commodities, we have to consider what was added. So normally uh, the residues are, are reflex of the what when the compound of the what was applied to the compound at that season. For boscalid, no, you have to consider the possible uptake, root uptake, for example, uh, of boscalid um, uh, from boscalid that was in the soil from previous application. So here, uh, because that's why we have to be careful with that because in this case of boscalid, the maximum residue level takes in consideration that not only what was applied according to GAP, at that, that, uh, at that specific trial, but also the possibility that that plant was grown uh, in the soil that was previously uh, treated with boscanid. So this is uh, a very good information that um, some countries, for example, here in Brazil, uh, succeeding crops uh, studies, uh, rotational crop studies, uh, were not uh, required in the past. In the past, so now there is a revision of the legislation. So I hope this kind of studies is request. But in any case, you can get this information from uh, studies conducted in other countries. Uh, and now you are uh, another example where actually there is a, a compound that is in this case. It's very degraded on the plant's surface, photodegraded in the plant's first surface. You see that uh, photolysis is a very important uh, study. Uh, but in this, in you see, for example, this compound, uh, Meptil dinocap, uh, it's uh, one of the uh, stereoisomers of dinocap. Uh, it has this long number here, name here. You can also call him by his nickname, 24DNOPC. So, but you see in this uh, figure, how many degradation products are uh, result of the photolysis. But in this case, different from the Boscalid case, uh, you do have many compounds produced uh, you see here that you have um, hydrolysis of this ester bond here in this, in this position here. Uh, so you have many different products here. You have, uh, yes, you have the formation of this ring here. You have different things that can happen, catalyzed by the light. But in this specific case, uh, the, how the degradates are formed in a very, very low concentration. So there was no major degradate products and there is no impact of, on the final residue. So uh, we recognize that it's highly uh, uh, degradated in plant surface by light, but actually none of those metabolites or degradate products are major. So we don't consider them in the final uh, residue definition uh, to, uh, we don't consider that that will really impact the final residue find in the crop. So this is uh, an important issue. So it's, uh, and Jason, uh, I'm gonna change a little five bit minutes. the subject. Okay, five minutes for the break. Okay. Uh, and now we move from a little bit from uh, meta from environmental fate studies 
and go a little bit on the farm uh, metabolism in farm animals. And this is important because toxicology, the, uh, the toxicology panel uh, evaluates studies, metabolism study and toxicological studies in laboratory animals, mostly rodents, rats, and, and mice. And, but here we are concerned about the metabolism studies in farm animals, hens, goats, cow, that's, that's the issue here. And what the company has to provide, uh, they, they, they studies, I did not get into detail of uh, on the studies here, uh, but they studies should provide uh, information enough to draw a metabolic pathway. And the company should give the chemical name and the structures of those metabolites. And normally the companies, they conduct um, it's important to conduct, to conduct um, the metabolism study in different kinds of crops. So normally the company um, conducts studies on uh, apples and then on wheat in some one cereal, normally wheat. So uh, some kind of representative crops for the other crops uh, that you could extrapolate the results of one study uh, conducting one crop for other crops because those are very expensive studies. So uh, it's not necessary to conduct metabolism studies in each crop uh, for which the compound will be, will have a registration. So, but you have to conduct metabolism studies in crops that are key for that uh, use and can be extrapolated to other uh, crops. So um, they studies, they are very complicated studies, uh, but they have to be able uh, to draw a metabolic pathway uh, with the possible metabolites, yeah, including intermediates, some compounds that you don't find in the plant, but are intermediate to reach that plant. And you need to have you, have to, you need to identify these metabolites to have the chemical structures and give a name uh, to them. Sometimes they don't give a name, they just give a code. Uh, but you have to quantify the levels of those metabolites. In animal commodities coming from uh, farm animal metabolism studies, you have to quantify the, the metabolites in fat, muscle, kidney, liver, eggs, and milk normally. So this is the base uh, that you have. Why? Because you want to derive later one uh, residues and in most cases recommend a maximum residue level for those uh, animal commodities. So you need to quantify the metabolites and see uh, where they are found and at which level those metabolites are found in each uh, compartment of the animal. Normally the levels in muscles are very low and, and they are much higher in kidney and liver. And in the plants, in the, pla in the plant surface, in the leaves, in the stems, in the edible roots, in that case. Um, and you have to do, uh, in some case, the metabolism studies uh, in crop rotation, because again, in crop rotation, you can have, uh, as I mentioned before, different compounds uh, that are formed in the soil that may be metabolized in the plant. Uh, this information should provide the basic evidence to support, to propose a residue definition for plant and animal commodities. You cannot reach a conclusion on residue definition without environmental and metabolism studies. You cannot at all. Uh, and for animal commodities specifically, uh, determine whether or not a residue should be classified as fat soluble. If you see the residue definition of the compounds, there is always for residue definition for animal commodities, always that, always that um, sentence there. 
the compound is fat soluble or the compound is not fat soluble. And that comes uh, mostly from the metabolism study, but uh, of course the uh, physical chemical characteristics of the compounds uh, like the PQOW, the solubility in organic solvent also adds to reach, the, to reach the conclusion if the compound is fat soluble or not. So, so this uh, might be a good time. Uh, yes, I think so. Yes, okay. I think it's a big It's a good All time right. for us to start to stop. How much? Uh, how long is the break, Jason? We're gonna have a ten minute break, and uh, I'm hoping that the uh, folks can stretch a little bit during that time, and also they can start thinking of some questions because at the end of your next session, uh, where we're, we'll we end toward the end of the day, we're going to have a question and answer uh, time. So I'm hoping that they use this time uh, during the break to think a little bit about some questions that they might want to have and stretch and, and just get ready for round two. Okay, 10 minutes is enough, maybe. Yes, because it's already 1224, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> okay, so and see you in, in 10 minutes. See you in 10 minutes. And I'm gonna ask uh, our other colleague, Veronica Cado, who's going to be sharing a video presentation during the 10 minutes. So besides just stretching and uh, um, relaxing, uh, you can actually watch uh, some uh, a, a presentation that uh, we put together for you. So uh, thank you. And Veronica, if you could play that uh, presentation, that'd be good. I think we need to stop sharing the screen and Adriana so Veronica can load the video. Thank you. Thank you. That was a very great uh, video. Uh, really appreciate the work that was put into uh, making that. Thank you, Veronica and Adriana. I think that we're ready to call back the uh, the workshop uh, from Eloisa. So I'm just wondering, is Eloisa ready to pick up on the slide where she um, she stops just before break?
Can you give me two minutes? Yes, we can. Then we'll take, we'll give two more minutes. So we'll wait. Just let us know when you're ready. Okay, <clears throat> let me share again. Let me put the presentation mode here. Whoops. Okay, um, coming back to these, in these slides, actually I saw that uh, there are not, I don't have too many slides anymore because I was really concerned about how much information, additional information I should put in it. So we may even start uh, the next section if we have time today, uh, because I noticed that the residue part uh, actually maybe we'll have more time so we may even start the section two today if we have time uh i want to point out something um more, many many times in the evaluation you don't see you you see the rotation crop studies within the met, the plant metabolism section so uh, just saying that for you if you're looking for uh, rotational crop, although in the in the manual is within that table under environmental faith, uh, in most times is included in the evaluation within the plant metabolism studies. So just if you go and look for uh, the evaluations available in the in the FAO documents, you just uh, look at that if you are interested particularly in the um, uh, uh, plant rotational crops. Uh, so this, we finish um, the first part of today in, with this slide. And again, we need metabolism studies to uh, define, to help us to define the residue definition. And the residue definition is something very important. We don't go forward in a compound if we don't have all the data to establish a residue definition. Uh, and in addition to the metabolism study, we do have analytic, we need analytical methods uh, that will be able to analyze the compounds for the residue that are included in the residue definition. So uh, that's why I, I said that metabolism studies are so important because we don't, uh, we don't go forward. For example, going back um, in the rotational crop, this year evaluation cannot say much about it because the report was not yet released, but there was one compound for which rotational crop uh, were not um, included in the evaluation. So uh, no uh, 
uh, residues were the term for plants for which they are, uh, they may be submitted, uh, they may be planted um, in a rotational circle. So metabolism studies, including rotational crop are essential because otherwise we cannot go forward. So uh, in this compound specific, I, I don't remember, but we evaluated this compound in 2021. Uh, we could go forward with the residue definition and we could make recommendation only for crops that are not rotated. For all the other crops, although there were uh, uh, residue data provided, we could not go forward because there were no rotational crops, no rotational crop studies provided. So just to emphasize how those studies are important. And what is the new, the residue definition? Yeah, The residue definition, they are established within the GMPR uh, for new compounds or for periodic review compounds. Normally, uh, with the exception of some cases, for example, this year, I don't remember the compound anymore. Also, we had to revisit the residue definition for one compound, although there is an there was not a new compound, neither the compound was uh, in the periodic review program, but we had to review the residue definition because some additional information came out. But unless there is a very special case, we only establish or change the residue definition for new compounds and new compounds for GMPR does not mean new compounds new compound. Sometimes it's new compound in the system. Some, some, sometimes this new compound, of course, it had to be registered in a country before. So it was not a new for many countries, but it's new for the GMPR CCPR system. Uh, and we have to establish kind of four residue definition. Residue definition for enforcement, that means for compliance with maximum residue levels uh, for plant and animal commodities and residue definition for dietary uh, risk assessment or estimation of dietary intake for both plant and animal commodities. So for enforcement, it's very important to have a simple residue definition uh, as much as possible. So normally, we look for a residue definition for enforcement uh, that is the, the, the parent compound only. Sometimes we have to add additional, uh, a major metabolite in plant uh, or in animal uh, because for enforcement, there is a need uh, the, the enforcement, the, lab, the laboratories that conduct monetary uh, monitoring studies within a country, they need to, to have a feasible method. In most cases, there are multi-residue methods. They have to have the analytical standard for the compounds and metabolite. So normally we look for a marker. For enforcement, we need a marker uh, of the use of that compound in, in the crops. That's what we need for enforcement. For dietary intake, uh, so that's why in, for enforcement, we only include a metabolite or a degradate compound in very special, uh, in, in very special case where actually the compound itself, the parent compound is not a good mark, a marker of the use of the compound uh, by itself. It needs something else. For dietary intake, is different. Uh, actually, we need compounds, metabolite, include most, most, most case of the dietary intake residue definition includes many metabolites. And I may say, this is getting more and more and more complicated over the years. Uh, 10 years ago, maybe we would only add uh, a metabolite in the residue definition for dietary intake only when that was really, really necessary because the problem here is that 
It's very difficult to have the standards of most metabolites. Uh, the companies, they synthesize those standards to conduct their studies. But um, the monitoring laboratories, normally they don't have access to those, to those standards. Those are C C13 stable isotope standards. Uh, and, uh, and most of those uh, metabolites, uh, uh, they are not, um, no, they may be, be labeled or not be labeled, of course. But no, most of those metabolites, which has to be synthet which have to be synthesized, they are not commercially available. So sometimes at GMPR and in some countries as well, we have a residue definition for dietary take very, very complicated. But really is very difficult to generate data at national level that include those metabolites that were included in the residue definition for dietary intake. And I'm telling you, things are getting more and more complicated over the years. So uh, here for dietary intake, that's why it's important uh, they are important to derive the STMR, the supervised trial medium residue and the HR, uh, which are used in the uh, dietary risk assessment. So uh, we're gonna see some examples um, along the week. So residue definition, key information. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna give some uh, one example for plants. Uh, for, so, so is the phenoconazole which is a triazole. It was evaluated in 2007. And um, so the company provide actually metabolism studies in many crops, many oceans, other crops, uh, cereals. Uh, I'm just giving here some, uh, this is um, the metabolic pathway uh, that the company uh, provides suggested uh, proposed for wheat, uh, for plants, actually, in general, normally with very, very few exceptions, uh, the, metabolite, the metabolism pathway in plants, they are similar among the plants. What may change is the percentage and is how the compound is metabolized, uh, I mean, uh, quantitatively. So sometimes uh, one metabolite in one plant uh, is formed at higher level than other metabolites. But normally the pathways, because the enzymes in the plants, they are basically the same. So it's very rare to have one metabolite that is found in a single plant uh, that is not found in the others, but it happened, it may happen. So we have in a very few occasions, uh, we needed a residue definition, a separate residue definition for a specific group of crops. Uh, sometimes we, we needed a residue definition different for uh, a crop that is rotated because a specific metabolite coming again from a degradation product from the soil. Sometimes we do have a different residue definition for a processed commodity because uh, a compound was formed during the processing of that commodity. But in general, in general, we have a single residue definition for plants. So here you see the metabolism pathway of difeconazole. And difeconazole was, um, in this study here, was labeled here in the triazole ring. <coughs> Sorry. And normally we have a table like that. In this case, it's um, the metabolites that were found in wheat, specifically in wheat. So we have, we, we have the value of the total radioactive residue. Uh, and of course, uh, during the experiment, you have to recover as much as it's possible from the radioactivity that was applied in plant. And this is the total radioactive residues, which is generated uh, in the plant. Uh, and we express that as the parent compound. And in this case, uh, 
very no the, the amount of radioactivity that was found in the grain was not uh, very much compared, for example, to the stalks. So you see that the rest of the plant uh, that is not the grain, uh, this was uh, the the plant was mature at harvest day, twenty four days after the fourth application, uh, and then you have a high residue radioactive residue in the plant itself, but not much in the grain, very few in the grain. So you have to know how much of that radioactivity I could extract using normally a solvent, citronatrile, water, methanol, or a mixture of those. There are some parts of those residue that are not extracted. And in this case, uh, they, comp the, they, they studied the, the, those non-extracted residues by normal solvent. They are submitted to hydrolysis, uh, enzyme hydrolysis, as the hydrolysis, base hydrolysis, because what, if it was not extracted, it's probably they were bound to the natural components of the plants or they were conjugated with uh they were because uh they were conjugate with some uh, cofactors in the plants so uh here in this case for example uh 23 percent of what was extracted from the grain uh was not extracted actually uh was bound to natural products to sugars the radioactivity is bound to something else or some of those compounds were, uh, were conjugated with some, uh, some cofactors. So in the grain, the radioactivity that was extracted actually was so low that it could not be, the, the, the compound itself was below the LOQ. Nothing was really found in the grain. And none of metabolites was not found with the exception of the triazoyl acetic acid and the 1,2,4 triazole. With the 1,2,4 triazole, it's actually this part of the molecule. Uh, yes, it's here. So in the gray, you could only find uh, this part of the molecule, the, uh, the TCA and the 1,2,4 triazoles which are not specific for these, difficult, uh, these triazole compounds. And another important thing that you have to remember when you make a residue definition uh, for enforcement uh, for a compound is that, for example, the triazole, it's a metabolite that is found when any triazole compound is applied to the plant. So it's not specifically due to the application of the fenocomazole. Many other uh, triazole, all the other triazoles actually produce this metabolite because that's why they are triazoles because they have this moiety here. So the one to four triazole is never a good marker of, uh, uh, of the application of one triazole. So it's never used in the residue definition. Although uh, it, the percentage of the residue may be important. And something that I have to add is that what to include in the residue definition here, it's something that it's for the dietary take mainly, something that is higher than 10% in most case of the TRR. For example, here, the TCA and the, the TCA and the, 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 the one, two, four trials or could be a good, a good, it's present higher, equal or higher than 10% of the TRR, but actually it's not a good marker for difeconazole, not for dietary risk assessment, neither for uh, enforcement. Uh, so in this case, the rest of definition was based on what is found in the rest of the plant, which is basically triazole, uh, sorry, the parent compound, difeconazole because 50%, because here, as the residues were low, very low in the grain, we could not detect it, uh, the parent compound in the, in the grain, but you could 
found them in the plant. It just indicates that the major, the marker of defeconazole application to the plant is actually the parent compound. So if you analyze the parent compound for enforcement, you are really, uh, you can really enforce the use of the, the defeconazole in the field. So, and that's the purpose of the residue definition for enforcement. So from that, you, and these I'm just giving you an example for wheat, but that was for other plants as well. Uh, defeconazole was the major residue. So uh, here again, it's not specific for defeconazole, it's for the other triazoles. So you don't, you cannot include that in the residue definition. So that was easy. The residue definition for plants, uh, for enforcement, uh, for defeconazole is the parent compound. That was easy. And, and we hope all the time to have the parent compound as uh, the single residue definition. Uh, and in this case, oh, it's for both enforcement and dietary risk assessment. I forgot to, to say. It's only one residue definition for both enforcement and dietary risk assessment for plants. So that's, that's the most simple uh, case that you could have. But then you go to defeconazole, the metabolism in livestock. So they conduct studies on hands um, and in goats. So I'm just bringing here uh, an example for uh, the, the, met the metabolism pathway for goats, but normally they are similar. There are few cases where you can find, for example, the compound that I evaluate this year, metalaxyl, uh, there was a metalaxyl M, there was one single metabolite where you could find only in hands. Uh, you could not find them in uh, mammalian uh, animals, but normally you have the similar uh, pathway because you have similar enzymes in animals, in all animals. So here is the ficarazole, uh, and then you have different uh, roads of me uh, metabolism. Again, the triazole is formed, but again, it's not a good marker for anything. And uh, just want to uh, catch your attention to this specific metabolite. That is the CGA 2205-375. And uh, you can glucoordinate these metabolites and form, form also, and form conjugates and also form co sulfate conjugate. This is a very normal uh, metabolic pathway uh, in animals as it is in humans as well. So it's very common uh, when you have this kind of, when you, uh, so you form conjugates, which those cofactors normally here in the hydroxy group. So you, uh, in the objective of these, it's really to increase the polarity of, of the compounds to facilitate the excretion of the compounds. Uh, Formation of these glucuronide and sulfate conjugates are uh, a major, a major um, metabolism pathway, a detoxification metabolism pathway in all the animals, including in humans. Because what you do, you increase the polarity of that compound because the, the, the main goal of the metabolism uh, in human uh, or in animals, in our animals, in plants as well, it's really to decrease the toxicity of um, chernobyotics and you increase the potential of those compounds to cause any toxicity by increasing its polarity so it can be excreted in urine. And exactly that's what the glucuronide and glucuronide and sulfate conjugate does. So you hang a sugar here, or you hang a SO3 here, increase the polarity, and then the compound is excreted. And this metabolite here is, you're gonna see in the table, and you form conjugate, uh, glucuronate uh, and sulfate conjugate with all those metabolites. And then you have the table, because here is qualitative, but you need, 
a quantitative uh, tables table. And in this specific for difficonazole, they have they have conducted study with the difficonazole labeled here and labeled here as well. Uh, so this table is long because has the results of the study which was conducted with the label in the triazole ring and the result of the study uh, when the label was in here. So two different studies. Normally they use the same dose to the, to the animals. And, uh, uh, and you see here, oops, this, that what you find there. And then they analyze muscle, liver, kidney, uh, fat, and they analyze milk. If in the hand studies, of course, they analyze eggs. And uh, here you have the difeconazole, the levels in muscle, liver, kidney, uh, in milk, only in this milk sample here. But you find here that uh, the, this metabolite is really the major metabolite in livestock, in a specific case in the, in the goat. 10 times higher level than the parent compound. Here almost it's 50 times higher, 10 times higher, about 10 times higher, about 50 times higher. So defecanazole is present, but the metabolite, that metabolite here, it's present at higher concentration than the parent itself. So the parent is there, but the metabolite is really a major metabolite. So we have to consider that metabolite in the residue definition. So that's what it was done, both for enforcement and dietary intake for animal commodities. And that is extrapolate because the studies on hands shows similar uh, pattern is the sum of defeconazole, which is the presence, the, the parent compound, and the metabolite. And here, the name of that metabolite, CGA uh, 205, 375, is spelled it out. Yeah, because this code is the code that was given by the company, but the compound has a chemical name. And you have also to express that residue definition as the parent compound, which is the fecanosol. So in this case, the residue definition for both enforcement and dietary intake is, includes the metabolite. So if you want to enforce uh, the, uh, the use of the, the compound that will impact uh, the MRL in the, uh, in the, animal commodities, you have to include the, these metabolites. So you have to buy the analytical um, standard in summary. So that's what you have to do. If your laboratory analyze animal commodities for that compound, you do have to buy uh, um, the standard for the metabolite, not only for the fecanosol, which is not relevant for plants, um, but is relevant for animal commodities. Um, there are normally the laboratories that uh, most of the laboratories enforce only the uh, MRLs for plant commodities. But if you really want to enforce also in animal commodities, uh, and I hope I can explain to you how we derive the MRL for animal commodities uh, during this, this week, and then you have to buy the metabolite analytical standard. There is no way to, to go away from that. And as I said, uh, this residue definition mainly for dietary take is getting more and more complicated these days because um, many countries or for example, uh, European, uh, the European community wants to include many, many metabolites that may have some toxicological concern in the diet, in the residue definition for dietary intake. But many countries, many laboratories, they have no way to enforce that. But it will affect um, the dietary intake and may affect, affect the establishment of maximum residue level for, uh, for that compound. 
So with that, uh, we finished that section. I really did not include too many additional information for the metabolism in plants and animals because I wasn't sure if the organization really did not want me to talk about it or just forgot. Uh, so, uh, but I'm open for questions and we may have time, it's one o'clock, depending on how it goes, to introduce section two because uh, I will need some additional time for section three. So maybe it's a good idea to, to, to start already with section two, if we have time, of course. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, so then we go to the second section that was kind of, I was kind of, I was asked to talk about, and that goes to the laboratory people. Yeah. Uh, the people who are in the laboratory. And of course, when you evaluate the data provided by the, the companies who uh, run the studies, that has to do with sampling, sample preparation and analysis, efficiency of extraction and stability of residue. Uh, this all is part because if you look at the uh, evaluation document of GMPR, so that what comes after the metabolism studies is exact, exactly the analytical methods. So we're gonna talk a little bit about sampling sample preparation processing, stability of residues during processing and uh, deep frozen storage and uh, the analytical method. So everything is important for uh, the analytical method section that it's in the, in the manual. This sampling, um, it's more relevant for the people who are in the field uh, because when we, we receive the dossier, yeah. When we receive the studies, the residue studies uh, from the company, normally uh, the, the studies are normally conducted according to GLP, good laboratory practice. And normally you have a section, the field section, the study that was, all the details of this, that study that were conducted uh, in the field when you apply the pesticide, sample the pesticide and the analytical part. Uh, that is when the sample who was collected in the field arrived in the in the laboratory um, in the laboratory. Uh, fortunately, I had some years ago, kind of ten years ago already, uh, I had the opportunity to work with Arpat Ambrush, where a master student of mine, because I'm an analytical chemist, so I'm a lab person. Uh, uh, a master student of mine, uh, her project was really to go to do everything, was to derive the variability factor that is, you, is used to the acute uh, exposure. So we had the opportunity to go to the field, to apply the, the, the pesticide to the crop. So we did that experiment, experiment with papaya, with uh, guava, uh, eggplant. So we had that experience of going to the field, applying the sample there, sample the crops, uh, and then take to the laboratory uh, and then analyze it. So that was good because then I could see the whole process and see how much sampling was important. So who is um, designing an experiment to be conducted uh, really have to think about doing a sampling uh, in a correct um, in a correct way and reporting in the report the study report how the sampling was done. So you do have to to think about it ahead of the, of the time. We had there was one study where we had some problems, so we had to abort the study because it was not. Uh, 
uh, it was not our fault, but um, that's why I always say that you have to follow close all the steps because when you delegate things to others, uh, maybe they will not do things properly. Uh, so if the sample is not properly done, everything else, even if you have the most adequate, the most, um, the state of art of analytical methods, the data that we will obtain will be worthless. You're not going to use the data. Uh, so you have really to pay attention on uh, packing, labeling, shipping, storage, how you pack, you have to avoid cross-contamination, you have to label correctly that sample that you are uh, collecting, you have really to ship uh, that sample to the laboratory under uh, storage conditions that are adequate. Normally, if you are away from the lab, you really have to uh, to storage at uh, adequate temperature. If it's not so so far away, you can storage at um, five degrees centigrade, but it's very long. You have to freeze the sample uh, if you have to ship for far away from the lab. So what you have to plan the studies to really assure because the residue that you're going to have in the residue trials, the level of the residue should reflect the residues in the sample after you harvest the sample at the PHI. So, but of course, you cannot take the sample and analyze right away, but you should to really preserve the residue that is left in the sample after you harvest at the correct PHI uh, until you are able to analyze in the lab because the MRL will ref reflect that time there when you harvest the sample. So it's very uh, important to, to preserve the integrity of the residue and the identity of the sample during the whole time. Uh, so, and of course, the sample that you are sampling will depend on also some procedures will depend if you were, you're going to use uh, soil, uh, the analysis will be for soil, if you are doing a rotational crop or metabolism studies. And for the, also if it's supervised uh, field trials, that's what I mentioned that really uh, harvesting the sample uh, at the PHI. So the sampling is a very important part of the whole, the whole residue package. And we, as evaluator, we have to look, uh, to look at the, this part of the field, uh, part of the study to see if everything from application, not only sampling, I'm not going to detail on how the, the compound was applied, if they, I'm starting here from the sampling already, but we have to look how the compound was applied, uh, how uh, the, the application equipment was calibrated. So we have to look everything from the start of the, the study. Uh, and also, of course, uh, we are starting here when it's time already to harvest uh, and then go to the laboratory. When specifically when you are conducting residue trials already, you did all the metabolism, so everything is ready, you know exactly. First of all, before you start your residue trial, you have to know already what you have to analyze. So the companies or the country or IR4 should know already what is the residue definition. So what she should, what which residue, one residue or more than one residue should be analyzed. That's the first thing, okay? You don't start a residue trials if you don't know already what is the residue definition and what is the PHI, what is the gap rate. So you don't even start there. Uh, and also it's important that you have to harvest the sample uh, 
that's the raw, uh, raw agricultural commodity, the REC, as it moves in commerce. And the Codex Alimentary Commission has a document with the Codex Standard, uh, Standard 229, here's the link, where is the recommended method of sampling for determination of pesticide residue. And also uh, the part of the sample that has to be harvested, I think it's in the next, uh, no, part, the part of the sample that net has to be harvested needs to be known already because it's the sample as it moves in commerce. And you have here in this document, you have to, there are information on, uh, you have to select, for example, in a field, for example, in a orchard, for example. So you have many trees. You have to plan from which trees and how many units from each tree you're going to harvest. So you can actually have a sample that will represent that tribe. And that later one, that sample, which is the rack sample that was, that was uh, collected in the field, will be composed to form a composite sample that will be analyzed in the laboratory. So you have really to plan uh, really uh, from that tree, you have to make a kind of, it's not really statistical, but you have, you have to, and you have to indicate in the field report how many trees you have in that trials. For example, I'm, I'm, I think it's easier uh, to look at the, in the ocean, how many apple trees you have, for example, in that uh, normally you don't have too many trees because you don't have large areas that are applied. You have a, a select area and you have uh, the space between the tree. Normally they do that in commercial areas. Uh, and then you have to select plan uh, which trees in that many trees you're gonna take that samples to make a sample that will represent the application in that area and then send it to the lab to form the composite sample that you're going to analyze. And you have this information here uh, in this uh, codex document. Uh, it's important to see if um, here it's, um, it's, um, it's a figure that is in the manual uh, that shows very clear, for example, if you take very few sample size. If you take only one sample from that area, uh, here, for example, the variability of the residues will be much higher if you sample, for example, if you think about uh, a lot that have uh, 25, 24, you, you, and in that codex document, you have the minimum number of the sample size to really represent uh, uh, that the residues that will be in that plot. So for example, here it shows very specifically, if you take only one sample, uh, it will not represent very well that plot. At, here it has at day zero, when the day where, when you apply and 14 days after you apply. And you see that that distribution is becoming narrow and narrow that means that it will represent better the residue in that lot, in that field, as you increase the number of the sample size. And that means that six apple, 10 apple, 12 apple, and 24 apple. Of course, if you have 24 apple, you have to balance the number of units and, and with the feasibility of that, because if you have 24 units of apple, it's too much. How much are you going to gain if you have harvest 24 units of that uh, apple? Normally you need one kilogram, a minimum of one kilogram, but what it shows here that you really don't have to go as high as 24 apples because you can have a good distribution 
if you have a lower number of apple to represent the residue at that field. So uh, you're gonna have a variation uh, of residues among the single units, but actually you have to have a number of units sufficient uh, to have a composite sample when you blend all the apples that will show the distribution of residues in that um, in that uh, lot of or in that field trial. So it's always a balance. For example, if you have large crops, for example, watermelon, so it's big like that, very heavy. It would be good to have how, how much feasible is to have 24 or even 12 units of watermelon to take that to the field, to take that to the laboratory. I don't want to receive 24 or even 12 watermelon in the laboratory to make a composite sample. No, it's just too much, too much work. So, so for bigger units, you can have a smaller number of units to make the composite sample in the lab. Because we compose the units in the laboratory, not in the field, yeah? So we receive in the laboratory the individual, individual units of apple, and then we blend that. And then from that, we take a portion to that composite sample to analyze. So, so you have to balance, you have to be reasonable. But that document from the codex uh, really give the minimal uh, sample size and then um, for each different crop. So you, if you are planning to do a residue trial, and I'm sure people from IR4, people who run uh, the, the residue trials, uh, they know that. But it's also important for those, uh, for example, from a visa, from national authorities who are evaluating the, the, the field trials uh, to know those things, to accept or not those trials. Sometimes we, we have residue trials, they're not acceptable because simply uh, the, the, the sample was not correct. So we just don't use it. We just say they are not accepted. So it's important for those who conducted the trials to know those things, but also important for those who evaluate the trials to know if the trials were correctly done. Uh, so that's what we do in the laboratory, yeah? So uh, in the laboratory, what we do when the, the samples arrive in the laboratory and someone tells me some minutes before uh, the time ends so I can close. Uh, I don't know what time is it. Uh, oh, let me see. You, you have about 10 minutes. So actually, yeah. yeah. I don't know if uh, we should do. Yeah, I have my watch here. Now. <laughs> I have about nine minutes. That's good. Uh, so in the laboratory, sometimes we get much more than what's necessary to make analytical samples. So we have to remove the parts that are not applied to the residue, the, to the what should be analyzed in the, in, the, in, the, in the laboratory. So for example, this document and also in the FAO a manual, Appendix 6, you can see this codex standard on portion of commodity which they are now applied. For example, for leafy vegetables, is the whole commodities after removing the ovary obviously decompose or withered leaves. For example, if you harvest a cabbage, you have to remove that outer parts of the cabbage that actually are very dirty with earth. So you have to remove those parts. So sometimes the whole thing arrives in the laboratory, but you really have to only analyze the part that is described in the for that crop in the, in the FAO manual or the codex standards, because only the part to which the sample applies. Uh, and for example, if you have, for example, stone fruits, normally you don't, uh, you don't 
blend the stones with the fruit because it's very hard. So what you do, you remove the stone to analyze, but then you have to express the residues with the sample with the stone. So you have to know exactly how much of the stone represent to the to the whole uh, to the whole uh, stone fruit, for example, peach. But of course, you have to remove the stone because it's very hard to blend the stone because it's very hard. Analyze without the stone, but express the residues. Uh, sometimes you see that they express the residue with the stone, without the stone. We receive the data like that. Uh, and when the residues is expressed without the stone, we use that, for example, for, for dietary risk assessment. But for MIL, it's expressed as the whole fruit. So you have to, in the laboratory, you have to, to know that uh, before you do or when you are evaluating the, the, the trial. Uh, so you homogenize the sample, yeah, uh, of the analytical portion. And, um, and avoid, should avoid changing the concentration of the analytes. So uh, normally in my laboratory, for example, I have an analytical laboratory, although I do uh, rat studies, toxicological uh, studies with uh, rat, my model is rat uh, as well. Uh, but in the laboratory, what we do as a normal procedure, because some laboratories, they use dry ice, to process the sample, to really avoid degradation of the residue during processing. But in my laboratory, we don't do that because we don't have a machine to produce dry ice in the laboratory, neither in the nearby laboratories here in the university. So there was one time where we would buy the dry ice, but by the, times, by the time that we arrived in the laboratory, most of the dry ice was gone. So what do we do in the laboratory to, to preserve the integrity of the analyte is really as soon as the sample arrived to the laboratory, uh, we freeze it and only process the next day with the sample, with the frozen uh, sample. And with that, we really, the objective is really prevent uh, the residue. Sometimes we, for example, for the tire carbonates, we cut it in a very large piece uh, because the tire carbonates, it's not a systemic compound, uh, it degrades very quickly. So we really cut it in a very large piece uh, and we freeze it. For the other, for the multi-residue uh, method, we cut it in small uh, uh, pieces and then blend it uh, and then freeze it. And then the next day we blend it. So you really have to do everything in the laboratory to preserve the concentration of the analyte. And again, if you are analyzing the studies, you have to make sure that they did it correctly. Because otherwise, what they, want, they analyze after all, uh, it's a much higher, lower level than it, it is expected. It does not reflect the residue that we is expected when you harvest in the field according um, uh, in, at the correct PHI and at the correct gap. So of course, so you cannot control 100% everything, but you, you must, try to control most of the things. One thing that we've discarded some residue trials where, because uh, we actually, we receive, for example, the apple or the melon or the papaya in the laboratory. It's in the laboratory because we don't normally blend a whole watermelon, it's just too much. So we quarter the watermelon or the papaya or the melon and take parts of that to make the analytical sample. And, but we do that in the laboratory and we have discarded some trials because they did that in the field. We cannot do, so if you receive of the company, the residue trials really that uh, reduction 
of that sample that was collected from the key was done in the field, just describe the residues, the, the, the whole results. Because if you do that in the field, not under the right condition in the laboratory, uh, you expose actually the, the internal parts of the sample already in the field. So when it arrives, because sometimes the company do that to reduce the weight of the sample before it goes to the laboratory. But it's, um, it's something that want to save money, but actually all, it's a waste of money because these results should not be accepted. Uh, so this reduction of, of the analytical sample should be done only in the laboratory and not in the field. And I think with that, I think it's 2 p.m. Yeah, two minutes. Uh, I want to close this part and we will continue. And as I said, uh, we're not going to follow completely what is in the program because some things we really need more. And I would like to give more examples. Uh, uh, of course, because that's what people really would like to see some real examples that we face, real problems that we face at GMPR. So I think we can close.